I'm Kathy Dahlkemper. I'm the County Executive here in Erie County, and we want to welcome all of you uh, to Erie County who are not from Erie County. Uh, we'd like to obviously welcome all of you to one of our county government's greatest assets, and that is the Blasco Library, part of our larger library uh, system with our beautiful view along the bayfront. And uh, we chose this room because we knew it was going to be a gorgeous day. And so we were hoping to entice people from staying outside and coming in here and being part of a very, very important conversation. I want to thank my fellow commissioners, Amanda Holt, Senator Jay Costa, and of course, David Thornburg, for joining me here today. And I want to thank uh, the committee for being willing and, and, and wanting to come to Erie County, uh, to the northwest corner of Pennsylvania, and to hear the voices of the residents, uh, the citizens of this region. So, uh, and lastly, I wanna thank all of you for taking the time out of, I know, your busy schedules. It's a holiday weekend starting. And of course, we don't have too many 77 degree days in the middle of April. <laughs> so I know a lot of people might've been tempted to stay home and do yard work or go for a walk, uh, but thank you for coming out because this is a really important issue. And um, I'm grateful to be on the committee and be part of this. So with that, again, just a warm Erie County welcome. And I wanna turn it over now to our chairman, David Thornburg. Uh, thank you, Kathy. Uh, it, it is terrific to be here. This is this is a lovely space, and you're so gracious to have ordered up such a nice day for us. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, I have to say there is, I think, something really significantly symbolic about holding this meeting in a library. Uh, libraries are one of the the great sort of meeting grounds of democracy uh, in communities all over this this country, uh, and this is certainly a, a just a perfect spot. I have a personal interest in libraries as well because my wife is a children's book illustrator and one of my daughters is an author. And I'm pleased to say that about eight or nine of their collective books are on in the holdings here at the uh, Glasgow <laughs> Library. So a little bit of shameless self-promotion. Um, and uh, I, I am join uh, uh, Kathy and, and uh, I'm, I'm sure the other commissioners in thanking you for coming out on a... Uh, uh, a, a beautiful day and, a, and a, a significant day for those of you of the Christian uh, faith and a, and a very important week. So, uh, but this is, this is a topic that we're, we're very anxious to uh, hear your thoughts around. This is stop two of a nine region tour that will conclude in early June. Uh, we were in Williamsport a few weeks ago. We had a very spirited and energetic conversation with folks uh, to try to hear what's on their minds uh, and how uh, and their thoughts for how we can improve this process of uh, drawing uh, political maps. Um, let me just tell you a little bit about what to expect uh, over the next couple hours and, and how you can contribute to this conversation. Um, first of all, we are gonna be inviting you, those of you uh, who have signed up, or frankly, who would like to sign up, to come up here in groups of four or five uh, to have a conversation with us, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the format uh, when, we, when we get there. Uh, one quick note, I would uh, just forewarn you, one of the things that we did at our meeting in Williamsport, and I think we'll re repeat, is in your introduction, we're gonna ask you to name your state house representative and state senator, so that they know that you're here uh, and will be paying particular attention. So if you need to do a little last minute homework on that issue, <laughs> Now's, now's the time uh, to do it. So we'll be asking you to, to come up here to uh, offer a, a few minute, as in a two or three minute uh, comment on uh, basically uh, two things. One is tell us who you are and your, uh, something about yourself so that we uh, can uh, uh, get to know you a little bit. And the second, it's a, it's a basic two part play. What's wrong? in your view with the way that we are drawing political maps in Pennsylvania, and what should we do to make it right? So, you wrong right. <laughs> uh, we're trying to make this as uh, simple and straightforward as possible. 
Uh, we have a couple other opportunities if, for those of you who are, are uh, like a lot of people, are not as fond of public speaking. Um, there is a, uh, uh, a comment form that we've distributed and have available uh, on, at the sign-in, and you're welcome to uh, share your thoughts there. That same comment form is available online at pa.gov. Uh, also, uh, just as a little bit of an experiment, we have a flip chart back there, uh, which you'll see called, we're calling this the wall of democracy. Uh, and if you have a, a comment that you haven't been able to express or you just wanna leave behind, uh, you go back there, uh, grab a, a Sharpie or a, a marker and let us know what you think. Could be anonymous, could be with your name, just one more opportunity for you to uh, share your thoughts with us. Um, I think that's it in terms, oh, and, and coming soon, and we have your uh, contact information, we will also be circulating a survey that another member of the commission, uh, Leon Benesek, from, uh, who's a professor at Penn State, has developed, that again gives us another way of understanding uh, uh, your thoughts on, on this issue of redistricting. Um, so with that, I think, I hope that gives you a pretty good sense of uh, uh, how we're gonna conduct this. Again, we did this in Williamsport a few weeks ago and it was a pretty uh, robust conversation. We're trying to make this a conversation and not just a, a one-way uh, street uh, back and forth. So uh, that's the spirit of the enterprise. And um, I, I think at this point, I'm going to ask um, the first brave citizens, uh, looks like there are five of you to come up get yourself seated and then we'll do introductions all the way around. Or maybe I'll ask the commissioners to introduce themselves and then we'll begin with you. So if I could ask, I hope I get all these right, Art Leopold, uh, Marcia Metcalf, uh, Dan Goldstein, Chris Youngs, and Paul, K Paul. I think Paul knows, there you go. Okay, if you could come up and just grab a seat. The one thing, uh, too, I would just ask is that uh, the Pennsylvania Cable Network is here and recording this, and it's always helpful for those folks to get to have you get closer to the mic rather than further away. So uh, if you could, come on, don't be, somebody's got to sit next to the chair. Otherwise, I, I feel left out. Okay, let me start uh, by asking um, the, my fellow members of the commission uh, just say a word about themselves, including who represents them in the state uh, house and the state senate, uh, and uh, and then we'll start with uh, with you on the end there and go this way. So, Kathy, if you could just a uh, quick introduction. Uh, as I said before, I'm Kathy Dahl Kemper. I'm the uh, county executive here in Erie County, and uh, my state senator is Senator Dan Laughlin, and my state representative is Representative uh, Robert Mursky. Great. I am David Thornburg. My day job is I run the Committee of 70 in Philadelphia, which is a longstanding nonpartisan nonprofit advocate for a better government. Uh, I live in Philadelphia, and uh, my uh, state senator is uh, Art Haywood, and my state representative is uh, Chris Rabb. Senator Costa. Hi, uh, Jay Costa, state senator from Allegheny County, representing this half the city of Pittsburgh and some of the eastern suburban communities in Allegheny County. Uh, I serve as my own state senator. <laughs> that was an easy, that was a layup. And, and my uh, state representative is Summer Lee. Um, my experience in this space has been I served as a member of the Reapportionment Commission uh, back in 2011 and 12, and uh, was also a plaintiff along with Ms. Holt and some of the uh, Supreme Court cases uh, last at that point in time. Great. And I'm Amanda Holt, I'm the Lehigh County Commissioner, and as was mentioned, I was active in the redistricting issue back in 2011 and have continued on since then. I am represented by Senator um, Pat Brown and Representative Gary Day. Terrific. So, as promised, we're going to start here. Sir, if you could do just... Do I uh, just introduce myself or do you want my tell comment Tell us three on? things. Who you are, yeah. who represents you. Okay. Actually, four things. Okay. Uh, and then, what, what do you think's wrong with the process uh, that we used to draw uh, both the legislative maps and the congressional maps and what we could do to improve it? Uh, my name's Art Leopold. Uh, Ryan Bizarro, Representative Bizarro is my representative, and Dan Laughlin is my senator. 
and I'm a, a social justice activist in the area, uh, community benefit agreements, uh, education, environment, way heavy. And uh, I'm also a proponent of the uh, community college. We need a community college in the area, letting you guys know. Um, also, I want to tell you that uh, having the rights to vote is preeminent rights that we have. It's our only voice, really, as we interact with our elected officials. I wrote down a whole lot of notes regarding when to register to vote. I think at, when you turn 17, you got to register. When you get 18, you have your card. I think that would be an effective way. Everybody ought to be opted in, not out. And I think that would be an effective way to do that. Regarding um, who's eligible, I think that needs to be widely spread around. People need to know who's eligible to vote. Just start in high school. And we ought to cover everybody from new Americans to felons to everybody needs to know that they have a right to vote. Also, the voter ID for, I, for voting, you should have that free. You should be able to go get one free. If we're going to require it, if you don't have one, don't have a driver's license, that's something else, then you, you need to do that. That's important. Now, regarding the redistricting, obviously it was a mess. Supreme Court had to jump in and do what's right. I am dismayed that you folks, and welcome you for coming here. I really appreciate it. Here is a beautiful place. Hope you come again. Um, the problem is that now you defer to the assembly, as I understand it. The assembly then makes a decision, and I don't know about the weight of your recommendations. I trust that you're going to do the right thing, especially with Kathy on the panel, because Kathy's a fighter. She's not going to let it go down without being fair. But I don't know what it requires from you to give to them so that they implement a fair system. And so that is the flaw that I see is the assembly. Can't trust politicos to do this. You have to have citizens involved. And uh, you know, those are my comments. Um, I thank you for your time. Terrific, thank you. Let me just, uh, you, you prompted me to uh, maybe clarify one thing. Our, uh, uh, as the governor asked us in the executive order, our job is to deliver a set of recommendations to the General Assembly and to the governor uh, by the end of the summer, after uh, all these uh, uh, sessions, uh, with some recommendations uh, for how we can improve this process that ultimately, in my mind, my mind uh, leads it to become a process that people can understand and trust more than they do now. So uh, let me uh, stop there and see if uh, there are questions for Mr. Leopold from the other commissioners um, or other comments. Okay, terrific, thank you, sir. Thank you. And, uh, are you, you're Marsha Metcalf, I am. Betcha? Okay. Yes, I am Marsha Metcalf. Thank you for being with us. Yeah, thank you for, for coming and listening to us. Um, I live in Meadville, Pennsylvania. Uh, my state senator is Michelle Brooks, and my state representative is Brad Rowey. And I'm here today because um, I, re I really try to participate in the d democratic system. I always vote. I can't remember a time I haven't voted when I've had the op since I've been 18 years old. I'm active in political campaigns, as Kathy well knows. We celebrated her victory and we mourned her defeat, which was directly a result of redistricting. Mm -hmm. um, we were, I write letters to the editor. I contact my senators and my congressmen all the time about issues that matter to me, and I show up at forums. But I have to tell you that it's getting hard to get people to do that because people feel that their vote doesn't matter. They feel like that doesn't, you know, they don't have a choice in candidates. Brad Rowey, we've supported numerous um, other candidates to run against him, and he knows very well that he doesn't even hardly have to put up a fight. Um, so when I see, and other people see, the political system rigged to the benefit of the party that's in power, they lose their incentive to participate, and that undermines our democracy. And as evidence of that, seven eighths of the people who run for, for office in the state offices are, uh, don't have any opposition. There's no point in putting up opponents because they can't win. Um, more than, um, I, I think I said that wrong, seven eighths of the incumbents face no opposition. More than half of our state's general election candidates have no opposition from the other major party. 
So we find ourselves in strange looking districts, and I know you've seen the maps, where our votes don't make a difference. And this isn't something that just happened. It happens and both political parties are at fault because whoever is in party draws in, in power draws the lines. And that is, does not benefit the citizens. So they end up electing, they decide who gets elected. And I think there are many possible solutions and I don't think they're hard because other states have done it. Michigan and Ohio, there are models that we can draw on. And my recommendation I, um, and we supported it last year, would be for an independent, nonpartisan commission that would draw the lines. And there's a way to do that. Other states have done it, and we can do it here in Pennsylvania to fix this system. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, maybe I'll start with a question. Okay. Um, there are uh, two words that we often hear in these discussions when people start talking about how we could make this better. Mm -hmm. Independent is one and accountable is the other. Right. Um, and if you drill into those words a little bit, which is what we're trying to do, yeah. uh, you start thinking about what are the sources of independence? and What does that mean? Mm -hmm. and, and, and in some ways, if you're, if you're too independent, then maybe you're not accountable. One argument for having elected officials draw maps is, in theory, uh, that if they uh, do their job poorly and it's known that they get turned out at the next election. Mm -hmm. So I'm just on that, and I know I asked, it's a big question. Right. Uh, I'm just interested in what you think uh, would constitute uh, a, a sufficiently independent body or independent individuals to to participate in this process. Right, and I do understand the tension that you're talking about between you know, independence and accountable. And I think another word that we use a lot is fair, right? Um, and I think there, it is possible to put people on a commission who have the sufficient background, because I don't think the lines have to be that difficult. I think if you base it around population and keeping areas together that it makes sense to keep together, um, our county for, is a great example. You know, it, it's very difficult for us to advocate for things in our county because there are multiple representatives. You know, when our, our district goes all the way up into part of Erie County, it's, you know, and we don't necessarily have the same kinds of concerns with our schools and county government as Erie does. So I think it's possible to get people who are not beholden to either political party who can, I mean, I think probably a machine could start drawing the lines pretty, pretty easily. There's one right out there we could probably use to get started. And then, you know, doing what makes sense in terms of keeping areas together that need to be together where, where population is mostly equal. I think it can be done. And I think that other states have done it quite well. Okay. Other questions from mem members of the All right. Oh, uh, awesome question. it's kind of along the same lines as what Dave was asking about. What would what would independence look like to you? So, how what would demonstrate if a commission was appointed? How would you know that they were independent? Like, what would demonstrate to you that this is an independent commission? Well, I think I would want to see at least equal representation from um, the the parties for sure, not one or the other. But then I think I'd like to see some people on that commission who are knowledgeable and not necessarily um, you know, representing one party or another. I think when we think about appointing people to key positions to do that, whether they're um, you know, independent counsels or investigators, we have a way of doing that so that they, you know, first of all, there has to be a set of rules, right? Like what's gonna, um, constitute what, how the districts are drawn. And then I think somebody who, would, who we can trust to go with those rules and who perhaps is even um, you know, a representative of different regions of the state so that everybody feels like they have a, fair, they have a voice in this. Again, I'm really not an expert on the models, but I'm pretty sure we can look at these other states and come up with some good ideas. Thanks. And I have a question, too, and, and you may not be able to answer this, but if, if those who are speaking could think about it, and if someone does have an answer, how would we um, 
test this committee, this independent nonpartisan committee, uh, to make sure that what they have created is really something that we would consider to be fair and equitable. And, and, and that's a tough question, so you may not have the answer, but I just wanted to throw that out to anyone who speaks. Yeah, I'm not sure I do have an answer for that. Yeah. I guess you're, that, you're welcome to. <laughs> we, we can run the table here and then come back. Yeah, to okay. It. I mean, I guess that the the proof would be in the pudding, right? We'd see what the districts look like and whether you know it, they sort of make sense for the demographics and, and population. Okay. Why don't we um, move on, and then again we can uh, come back Sounds for good. other conversation. Really. Get you off the hot seat for the time <laughs> being. Uh, I'm going to guess you're Dan Goldstein. Don. Yeah. Don. Sorry about that. Uh, and here's a mic for you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm. Uh, my name's Don Goldstein, and uh, I retired a few years ago from Allegheny College, where I was a professor of economics for many years. Um, and my, I live in Meadville, so that uh, Brad Roy is my state representative and Michelle Brooks is, is my state senator. And I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit about what we know about the impact of gerrymandering on the business climate. Um, I follow research by a number of people, including a guy named Michael Porter at Harvard Business School, who's one of the nation's leading researchers paying attention both to business management and also uh, the public policy implications of that. And in 2016, Porter and a group of colleagues did a survey of local business leaders around the country in which uh, they asked them about what they view as being uh, impediments to a good business climate. And um, interestingly, political dysfunction just immediately rose to the top of the list both federal, state, and local uh, levels. And uh, among the various issues, uh, even coming in ahead of uh, campaign finance and um, term limits was gerrymandering. Um, uh, business leaders around the country at local levels uh, are talking about gerrymandering as a problem. And to me, uh, it what, that wasn't that uh, surprising. Um, I should have said when I introduced myself that I'm the Northwest Regional Coordinator for Fair Districts PA. So for the last two and a half years, I've talked to a lot of people in our community about redistricting reform, and I've talked to a lot of people about gerrymandering. From a business person's point of view, uh, it can be harder, especially for small businesses, to know whose ear they need to get to talk about an issue that they're facing. Um, the kind of pragmatic, across-the-aisle problem-solving that business leaders count on um, goes out the window. And entrenched politicians become deaf uh, to even the most ur urgent messages from their constituents. I think that in Pennsylvania, um, many of us are aware, and I think those of you on the commission are aware, we, we have a problem with this. Um, we have issues in the state having to do with education, infrastructure, um, and so on that are not being addressed. And meanwhile, we're wasting terrific amount of resources and time and energy, public space, on never-ending legal and political battles over drawing the district lines. The way the system is set up, the way the rules are written, this is inevitable. It's inevitable. Uh, that whoever is in a position to draw those lines, whichever political party is in a position to draw those lines, is going to take advantage of it. Um, I was told by a local business leader in Meadville uh, when I was, uh, I, I, got, I, I got a hold of him uh, as he went into the polling place uh, last November and also again when he came out of the polling place. And on the way in, we talked about the issue of uh, gerrymandering, we were petitioning for uh, an independent uh, nonpartisan citizens commission. In, on, on his way in, we talked about the problem, and on his way out, he gave me his kind of bottom line on it. And the bottom line was that in his heart, he knew we were right, that it wasn't fair, it wasn't right, it wasn't efficient. Um, but in his head, as a, as a good uh, Republican, uh, uh, lifelong Republican uh, activist, he couldn't go along with it because he knew and he perceived uh, that his, his peers knew that it would be detrimental to their interests to change the system. Will the Democrats be any different 
from that? I mean, we'll have a chance to find that out because after the 2020 census, if the rules aren't changed, um, while the uh, uh, Republicans will have an opportunity uh, through their control of the legislature to control, to write the, uh, to draw the lines for the congressional maps, um, by virtue of having a Democratic majority in the state Supreme Court, the Democrats are likely to have an opportunity to draw the lines legislatively. Um, and I don't think we're gonna see very much different from them because they, like my friend in Meadville, feel like the way the rules are written, this is what we have to do to win. Um, so we need to change the rules and we need to get uh, uh, the line drawing process away from the politicians and put into the hands of a body that would be uh, nonpartisan and independent. Um, and I just wanted to address that issue of independence and, and nonpartisanship for such a commission since it's clearly a vexing issue. Um, I think there's a difference between having a point of view and having a vested interest. Everybody, we hope, has a point of view. Anybody who's chosen through a random system or some other system for drawing the membership of a redistricting commission should have a point of view, politically, socially, um, spiritually, uh, et cetera. But what they don't have is what we have now, which is a vested interest in what the answer is. Uh, they can't uh, uh, aggrandize their own interests um, by drawing the lines in a particular way. And that at least clears the deck for us to have independence and nonpartisanship. Um, and I think if we, uh, if we give them the proper uh, uh, preparation, the proper criteria to use in drawing the maps, will have a successful result. You know, when you think about it, um, and maybe I should defer to the next speaker on this, but we have, we have, a, um, we have a, a pretty good um, uh, template for that in the jury system. Every time we have a jury, we get 12 people from all walks of life who aren't necessarily experts, who have their own biases and their own points of view, but we bring them together in a setting where they don't have a vested interest. And we give them a clear charge and we ask them to be fair. And um, you know, 95% uh, of the time, I think we, we would agree they are. So we set the system up, I think it can work that way. Thank you. Thank you, that's two helpful points of reference for our discussions. Uh, questions for, for Don, Kathy, Jay, Amanda? You mentioned about the need to have proper criteria. What would you consider to be proper criteria? Well, the uh, the state constitution has um, some some pretty good language on that. Uh, I think it's something like compact and contiguous. Lines should be compact and contiguous uh, unless uh, absolutely unavoidable. There's some kind of a phrase like that in the state constitution. It doesn't give a, um, an algorithm for determining compactness or uh, contiguity, but I think that those principles are the ones that we can use as basic criteria to put in front of our commissioners if we get such a system. Um, I know that there, there's a variety of mathematical uh, uh, models for, for how we uh, could define um, compactness and contiguity more, more exactly, but um, uh, like uh, um, previous speakers, I'll, I'll defer to the experts on, on which, if any, of those we should employ. I think the spirit of this conversation is we're all experts. <laughs> so let me ask you one thing. You've made this analogy to the jury system. Um, and, you know, the jury system, if you, I, I believe, it's your, your, your uh, service is pulled from the roster of registered voters. So if you register to vote, you're liable to be on a jury. And somehow some of us end up on that more than others. Uh, but there's no other qualification for your serving on a jury other than you're being a registered voter and presumably an interested citizen. Or would you be okay with that uh, lack of qualification to have people make the kinds of decisions we're talking about here, or do you think there should be some further uh, qualification or some uh, further bar that you should have to clear 
uh, prior to being selected randomly? I would, uh, that's a great question. And I, I should have uh, uh, mentioned this before, but I think that the, uh, the, some of the legislation that was advanced in the last session contained um, bars against um, elected officials or their immediate families and against uh, lobbyists and their immediate families from mm. serving on such a commission, and I think that would be wise. Okay, other questions? Terrific, we'll move along. Uh, I'm gonna guess you're Chris. Chris Youngs, all right, I'll share my mic with you. Thank you very much. I'm Chris Youngs uh, from Cochranton. That's Representative Park Wentling and Senator Michelle Brooks. Uh, and I'm a lawyer with an office in uh, Meadville. <clears throat> That's Brad Roy's district there. I think that a system which is run by partisan people naturally if you're a partisan, you've got to do that job, is to gain as much partisan ad advantage as you can get. And you wouldn't be doing your job if you weren't doing that. So as uh, Don uh, so well said, if, if uh, the party composition of selection change, changes in uh, a year or two, aren't the Democrats then duty bound to do the same thing? And I don't think that's fair either way. I'm a Democrat and I still don't want to see that because that won't last. And it just becomes, uh, as, as we said, our resources get spent. This, this is us paying for, for all these fights that we've had over uh, districting. We pay the Supreme Court salaries too and they finally settle it. I think that the, the engineering of political districts based upon demographics, upon data mining, upon knowing what you buy when you go on the internet and shop, and obviously your wealth, they may not access your tax returns, but you can find out a lot about me by, by knowing what my internet history is. That's wrong for the purpose of determining whose or what district we are placed in. Um, there's been a lot of things tried and, and, and found unconstitutional in the past. One of our problems we have is a constitutional process for doing what we're what we do to set districts, but um, the, these things go way back on many issues. Taxing the right to vote held unconstitutional. Things that the, the one person, one vote, loading up districts with 400,000 people here and 200,000 here, dilutes the right to vote. It also dilutes the right to vote when we intentionally get down to homes and streets and groups of folks to put them in different districts for the purpose of either gaining their vote or silencing their vote. That's dilution of the right to vote, and it's just plain wrong. So I would limit the things that can be considered, perhaps even the information that can be provided to those who district us. It would be certainly um, not the, uh, the concept of justice being, being blind does not mean justice is stupid. It just means that justice isn't going to consider things it shouldn't consider. The concept of uh, term limits definitely figures into the current situation because the people who are districting us want to serve typically in these positions forever. And that's not how I believe it was designed, but there's no constitutional provision limiting terms. Therefore, serve as long as you can, garner as much of a, uh, of a retirement as you can, stay as long as you can, and it's only natural you'd want to, to, to design the voting system to favor you. So to the extent that our elected representatives are involved in districting us, limit their terms. I don't have a specific solution to this. I think it's more, I think as Don said, some of the things you're going to not allow your districting people to be. You're, you know, you're not allowed to be certain things, and that's going to rule out people with those really hardcore vested interests. Because uh, independent doesn't mean you don't have um, some sort of an agenda, and it doesn't mean that you're, that you're stupid. It means that you, you don't have a fixed agenda and some end goal in mind. And there are a lot of people like that. It does mean that there's common sense. And that's, we mentioned uh, 
juries. Juries have common sense. Um, that's what we call juries together to do. Um, it's just, you've got life experience, we trust you. There will have to be some compromise in how districts are set. I don't think there's any way to not have a compromise, but it depends what that compromise is based upon. Is it just, um, is it something innocuous or is it something nefarious? Um, so that's all I have to say, and I appreciate the right to do that today. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Once again, comments, questions? All right, well, I'll, oops. Go ahead, Amanda. So you talked about things that shouldn't be considered, and then you talked about a concern with um, drawing districts to gain a partisan advantage. So would you not want to eliminate like um, political information? Would, are you, are, when you talk about things you don't think should be considered, do you think that political affiliation is something that is, falls into that category, of something that shouldn't be considered? Or are you thinking that is something that should be considered and should districts be drawn to create um, uh, uh, particular outcomes? Because you talked about you don't like the partisan advantage, so are you trying to make it not have a partisan advantage in the districts? Is that what you're talking about? Well, let, me, all, let me tag on one question, too. Sure. If, you, if you couldn't use uh, registration data or other kind of political or partisan identification for the data, how would you then know that you were in fact drawing districts that didn't accrue partisan advantage? I don't think there's a simple solution to that. I mean, well, I, I think where you, where, you, where you go is, that, is that, that doing something is better than doing nothing and what we have is bad. <coughs> I think you'd have to commit to being willing to re-examine whatever you, you generate in the future, not be fixed on that. Um, I think going for the compactness and the contiguousness, nothing stretched out that looks like a game animal, um, is, is something to shoot for. Um, there will be districts, just because we are concentrated with Democrats in the east and west and the rural areas are, are not. You're going to have overwhelmingly one-party districts, and there's no way to avoid that. But, but to, uh, I have really not much else to offer on that. I don't think, I, I, I'm not an expert on that by any stretch. Um, I'm not sure how, you, how you're going to get there, but you've got to start and be willing to re-examine what you've done openly, admit mistakes, move on, and keep trying to fix it as a work in progress. Terrific. Thanks for your thoughtful feedback. And I think we'll move on to uh, Paul and I forgot. I, I'm, your handwriting is not very good, so I, <laughs> I'm having trouble reading your name. Never has been and always will be. <laughs> okay. Thanks for being here. I'm Paul Carpenato. I live in uh, Mill Creek Township in Erie. And my state representative is Ryan Bizarro, State Senator Dan Laughlin. And I want to thank you for coming to Northwest Pennsylvania. A lot of times people hesitate to especially some of our elected leaders to come to this area because of the weather. As you can see, we have wonderful weather. <laughs> Please come back. Uh, and first, when I heard about the timing of the meeting, I was concerned because for many of us, it happens to be Monday, Thursday, or Holy Thursday, and we may not be able to attend the church service of our choice. But then I thought about it some more, and I don't know if it was an accident or if it was intentional, but if it was intentional, then I have to commend you because that would show a true separation of church and state, so I would commend the Commissioner <laughs> Governor Wolf on that. Uh, like Don, I've been involved with Fair Districts PA for a couple of years. And the more I learn about gerrymandering, the more I see that it is a very serious problem, not only in Pennsylvania, but throughout the country. Uh, we saw it locally in the congressional redistricting that happened after the 2010 census. We had a district that usually went Republican, but not always. There was some fairness in it. Um, but with that redistrict, thing for Congress, they split Erie County in two and created two districts that virtually guaranteed that a Republican would be elected. Uh, many Democrats simply would not even run for office because they knew they had no chance. Previously, like I say, it was a fair district that leaned Republicans, but at least both parties had a chance, and this re gerrymandering really took any sense of fairness away. Uh, the Supreme Court made a fix 
But unfortunately, that's only a temporary fix, and I don't know if a lot of citizens realize that. So until the law is changed and until our state constitution is changed, we're not gonna have a good fix, and I believe this is what you're, you're trying to accomplish here. Uh, certainly through Fair Districts, we advocate for an independent, nonpartisan citizens commission to determine district boundaries. I think House Bill 23, House Bill 22, which were recently introduced, are good models. They may not be perfect models, but they're certainly a good starting place. Maybe they need some tweaking, but they would create an independent citizens commission to, to do the redistricting and would be much, much better than the current system that we have. Uh, concern I have is timing. Uh, as far as congressional districts, that can be changed with the state law at any time, so timing is not a concern there, but when it comes to the state representative and state senatorial districts, we really have to change the state constitution to make a change there, so we're, we're working on a very short time frame. So I would urge the committee to move quickly so we don't have to wait another 10 years to end this unfair and uh, often corrupt system. And I would urge you to work with Fair Districts PA because Fair Districts PA has put a lot of work in it and a lot of research, and I think that's the, it's, it's a certainly a great place for your commission to start from. I commend you for your work. Wish you the best, and thank you for coming. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I suspect I speak for all of us uh, when I say that uh, we all acknowledge and appreciate what Fair Districts has done over the last few years to uh, educate and, and engage people around this issue. It's, it's remarkable. Uh, in a state that is not often known for its uh, uh, citizen movements, uh, uh, it is, it is uh, to, certainly to your great, uh, great credit. So again, I think I speak for, for all of us. Um, again, questions for, uh, for Paul, Kathy? Uh, this is a question for everyone who's spoken because there's been um, a number of you who've talked about this independent commission. And my question is, how would, do you have a solution for how this commission would be chosen? I think that's uh, one of the questions that's kind of lingering out there if you want to make this an independent commission. We won't hold you to your answers. We're just looking for your creative thinking here, so. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I believe the way it is in the proposed legislation, and uh, hopefully I'm correct that there would be 11 member commission and there would be a pool from the Democratic Party of four, a pool from the Republican Party of four, and a pool of three from independents. I would probably want to make that four to make it seem even more fair. But people would be drawn from those pools. People wouldn't be appointed by an elected official. They would be drawn from the pools. And I'm not sure on the criteria of, of, of getting into the pool in the first place, but people would be drawn randomly, so that's that's one way that you get to more fairness. And is this list um, self-selected or is this, if you're interested, you just put your name on the list? I guess I'm not sure. I would think anyone should be able to put their name on the list. And I know there are criteria for, you know, elected office holders not being able to be in the pool, people who have been uh, in cert certain other positions uh, could not be in the pool. I'm going to raise something that uh, my colleague Amanda Holt sort of uh, framed a little while ago, uh, which is she said, you know, there's really three things that you can think about in this process. There's the who, who gets named to make the decisions. Uh, there's the, the what, which are the criteria that we could use to, uh, on which to base the decisions about how the maps are drawn. And then there's the how, which is the process that we could go through uh, that in could include public hearings or the, uh, an ability to challenge the maps in the court. There could be a whole string of things involved in, in that how. So I guess this is a question for any of you. Just be interested in your comments on which of you think is the most important. Uh, is, it, is it the who, uh, the what, or the how that we should be focused on to again, restore or earn your trust in this process? We are not asking you easy questions. You figure that out, so. I'll, I'll give that one a shot. Okay. Well, um, I think that for me, one of the most important things is uh, what kind of a backstop do you have in place? Because any group 
of individuals uh, could disagree. And I know that a lot of the debate over the legislation that was advanced in the, in the last session revolved around, um, well, what'll happen if they can't agree? Or what'll happen if um, the commission comes up with, if we do have uh, such a commission and it comes up with a, uh, a set of proposals that to some seems to be unacceptable. Um, and I think that uh, there are a number of uh, creative ways of dealing with that problem out there. If you look at some of the legislation that other states have put in place at this point, um, I know that Ohio's uh, puts it back to the state legislature, um, but it requires that if the state legislature has to intervene and uh, come up with either a modification or a replacement uh, for what the commission proposes, it has to pass uh, by a substantial supermajority. So in that case, um, the backstop is legislative, but the rules are written in a way that um, it has to be bipartisan to uh, an extent that would uh, prevent, uh, you know, kind of egregious uh, gerrymandering. Um, uh, another, another way of doing it that I believe has been reflected in the, in the Pennsylvania legislation that's been proposed is to um, have give, like let's say the commission members are deadlocked, give commission members the, the right to propose alternative maps, not just one. I mean, the goal is to come up with one set of maps. But if, the, if there turn out to be factions in the commission, and uh, they can't agree on one set of maps, then um, you could write the rules so that they uh, have to present, uh, let's say the two or the three top vote getting um, alternatives, and then let the legislature choose among them. Uh, at least then uh, the job of the legislature is circumscribed in a way that um, they, uh, they have to kind of follow along the path that was started by the commission, um, but using that accountability, that elected accountability that so many people talk about, um, uh, finish it up. That's in the unlikely event that you don't get agreement. Going back to the jury example, usually you get agreement. Great, any other uh, comments or thoughts on that question? Okay, or, or the, yeah, just to re refresh, my, I'm interested in w where you think the emphasis should be. Is it the who, the what, or the how? What, where's the power in, in achieving more? Anybody else want to take a stab at that? All right. Um, my colleagues, any further questions for, to toss out to the, uh, Participants? Amanda? I'll just ask one more. Um, I had a question for Paul here. You had talked about how Erie County, the way the congressional district was drawn had been fair before, and then it changed to be unfair because they split Erie County in half. So would you feel like if districts were keeping counties whole, that creates fair districts, or is that not necessarily the thing that made it unfair, the fact that it was split? I just wondered if you could clarify. I don't know if I'm really qualified to answer that, but I think there are things in the Constitution about keeping certain population centers whole that are supposed to be followed, and I think that was one of the criteria that, that wasn't followed. And certainly in some areas, it's going to end up that one party is going to win nearly all the time just because of the geography. But when you take data mining and you look at voting and voting patterns and exactly where people live, and basically the district line was drawn about one block away from our house, and a lot of people I know said, you're not in that district. Yes, we are. No, you're not in that district. Yes, we really are in that district. Representative Thompson is, was our congressperson. Uh, so I, th I think there, there, I guess there's a number of criteria. I, I'm just not an expert at all to be able to answer that, but I think keeping Keeping areas whole to the extent you can would be helpful. Splitting something that obviously should be kept together is not going to be helpful. Thank you. Yeah, did you have a thought? Uh, Don had mentioned that there in the Constitution, I think it says the 
draw fair and continuous areas. And so that would be trying to keep counties whole would be a preference. But obviously in some cases you can't do that, especially if you get down to Philly or maybe in the Allegheny area. So certainly that's a consideration to, to think about. And obviously to, to choose fair people for a commission is important. Um, and you know, as far as the, uh, the districts, you might wanna draw a map and maybe 90% of the state, everybody agrees on 10%, there's disagreement. Maybe just in those district areas is where you decide you, you need to make some options. So settle on what you can settle on and then the areas that are disputed, then leave those up to an arbitrator. Uh, I don't like the assembly in particular, but the courts seem to be the final decision maker. So that might be a way to go. Decide on what you can decide on and then leave that other five, 10% alone. Let me, uh, some, a couple of you mentioned this and let me throw this question out to you. A couple of you said, you know, every time we go through this, there seems to be an enormous amount of partisan squabbling and then it heads to the courts and there are lawsuits flying around and a lot of money spent on lawsuits. Um, I guess one question is how damaging do you think that is? And if we were to design a system that where there was less partisan squabbling and you know fewer lawsuits and fewer money spent on lawyers and lawsuits, would that be uh, a good measure that we were making making headway? And when we're trying to back get back to the like, how would you know if we had uh, a better process in place? Anybody want to take a crack at that? It comes back to that question of is it the who, the what, or the how? Right now it's the who has created the system and those are the professional politicians who, who have no really desire to leave the jobs. So they're legislating their own futures. If we take them out as the who, replace that with people who don't have these stakes, I think that really goes a long way toward, toward getting a result. The people who say, well, you, we can't change it because you can't offer me a perfect solution, that's the why your reason we don't change an awful lot of things. We want all of those things answered. You can't do that. You can't do that with much anything. But starting with the who will probably lead to a whole lot of things being different and better. And if there are th things that still need to be fixed, go ahead and fix those after that. Let me just say something about that. I think, of course, if we could come up with something that could reduce the decisions in the court and the lawsuits, um, with apologies to Chris and the money to lawyers, yeah, that would be a good thing. But I think it would also be a good thing because when that's the way it works and whoever has you know, the most money and the most power and can bring the lawsuits and fight those lawsuits, it just contributes to the point that I raise, which is voter cynicism and lack of participation in the system. And that is a fatal flaw, in my view, to our democracy. So I think it, it, we need to do something that the citizens trust, that they know what district they're in. And, and believe me, there's, there's confusion. I mean, you mentioned it, but when your district looks like an alligator, it's hard to know where, where, you're, where you're supposed to be and who your representative is. So yes, I think that would, that would be a good outcome. Okay, I think, uh, Senator, do you want to say something? Just a, a couple things. Um, first of all, the, the work that Fair District has done has been uh, outstanding, and I would suggest that, um, but since the time the original Senate Bill 22 was introduced, it's changed quite a bit. Um, now it includes um, participation by the majority leader and the minority leader in the Senate and two-thirds confirmation of appointees and the like. Um, if that ends up being the case, do you deem that to be a sufficient level of independence or does that go against the grain of independence that you're looking for in a commission? If in fact you have some sign off by or selection of some of the members from majority leaders in the House and the Senate and confirmation by Senate members, two thirds confirmation. I mean, how, how does that impact the fact where we end up at? And I'm not sure that even Fair District supports, I don't know if what they support the particular version right now or not. My no, understanding is they do not. They do not support, but I think that's kind of what's out there right now. Um, that seems to me to be 
contrary to the notion of independence. I'm just interested what your folks might think. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be happy. I think you've heard me talk about we need to keep the politicians as much as possible out of it for the majority of the decisions that are made. Anybody else want to take the swing? As far as advancing the measure, um, we've not been able to move 22 in the manner that we saw it last year before, before the amendments that were made. So at what point do we, to get something done, do we scale back and, uh, and compromise to get something done? I guess is the question as it relates to involvement by members of the legislature, or in particular leadership members. On that spectrum, where do we, where do we end up at? That's, I guess um, that's my question. Yeah, I think. Otherwise, if I can interrupt you, otherwise yeah. we don't do anything as you suggest and nothing happens because we can't get it done. Right. And I think that's what the goal needs to be, figuring out the best way to get to a place where we can all agree that we've got something done. I'm I, think, I think for a lot of us involved with Fair Districts PA, um, we've had quite an education about the political process. You know, we're, we're, we come from all walks of life and many of us had very little experience with that. And one of the things that we've learned is that um, you can't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, we, we understand now uh, the importance and the inevitability of compromise. Um, I think that Senate Bill 22, as it emerged at the end of the last session, was viewed by us as being um, a reasonable compromise, something we could live with. Including um, the court piece or without the court piece? Without, you're talking about the, uh, the almond? Yes, and, the almond amendment. Uh, without that, okay. before yeah. that, that. That was a, I probably I mean, shouldn't say that. That, that was a poison pill. Yeah, I understand. Um, yeah. But um, before that, uh, which was uh, uh, bringing in a, a, an unrelated issue that um, uh, it was known would, would make the whole bill unacceptable. Um, before that, it was a good faith, reasonable set of compromises. Um, and I think the feeling now is that we're starting that process over again. So, you know, let's go in now from Fair District's point of view and argue for uh, what we really want. But we well understand that as the process goes forward and, and hopefully, uh, um, you know, with the assistance of uh, um, uh, members of both houses uh, uh, in, with good intentions um, working together, we'll come up with something. Um, the Ohio legislation that I mentioned earlier does actually accord a much bigger place to the legislator, legislature in signing off. Um, it has supermajority um, provisions in it. And uh, if that's where we end up after this session, you know, I'm guessing we're gonna say, well, so be it. Uh, it's not ideal for the reasons, uh, you know, that others have, have, have raised. But um, yeah, we've, we've had quite an education and I'm sure we're gonna to continue to learn. <laughs> we've had some good teachers. Uh, I spend a good deal of my time <clears throat> in our representatives and senators' offices. And the only way you can move government is to be an activist, to stand up and speak out. And so I'm not willing to acquiesce. I think if you have a desire and a need and you have a goal, I think you express that and you petition your representatives and you tell them where you stand and you make it happen. That's just my view. Well, uh, I, I think our time with this group is up. Thank you all so much for your thoughtful uh, insights. Uh, we've raised a lot of important questions that'll keep coming up uh, in the next round. Uh, and, uh, and again, thank you all for participating. Mike Wilcox, Logan Ford, and Robin Coxon. And while they're coming up, thank let you. me just so. you. make you aware of some. Thank, thank you. you. Make you aware of some other folks who are here. Um, at the back there, on your way in, or maybe on your way out, you'll see uh, the folks from Draw the Lines PA, uh, which is a group sponsored by my organization uh, that has been working the last six or months or so uh, on a uh, 
we'll call it a crowdsourcing project to allow any citizen of Pennsylvania, age 13 and on, uh, to uh, give you the data and the software that you can use to draw your own congressional maps. And uh, we've had over 2,000 people now participate in that process. It's a competition uh, that uh, has cash prizes at the end. So uh, if you could use a little walking around money or if you have a college student, son, daughter, or a high school student, uh, we encourage you to learn about Draw the Lines PA. Uh, this is the largest experiment in citizen mapping in the history of the Republic here in Pennsylvania. Uh, founded, or funded by Pennsylvania foundations, just so you know, uh, and has been wildly popular in schools and colleges and universities, including, I should shout out, uh, to the good folks here at Mercyhurst and Gannon who were among our prize winners this last round. So there's a competition underfoot that ends, uh, I think, May 20th, uh, 30th, 31st. May 31st, drawthelinespa.org, and you can talk to Rachel uh, Kolker at the back there if you want to learn more. So back from our commercial break, um, and uh, uh, if, if you all have lined up in order, are you Luke? You, you're very, you guys are very good about arraigning yourselves here, but uh, thanks for being with us. And again, marching orders or tell us a little bit about your, yourself and who represents you. Uh, tell us what you think is wrong with the way we're drawing maps now and how we can best make it right. Hello, my name is Luke Bratton. I'm 16 years old. I live in Wattsburg, Pennsylvania. My state representative is Kurt Sonny and my state senator is Dan Laughlin. Uh, as I said, I live in Wattsburg, so I go to Seneca High School. I participate in all my student government and I'm very involved. I, uh, I see these, these districts, um, especially Erie. I live in Erie. And um, it being split is a little disheartening. I mean, my grandparents live uh, across the city and I can't have the same representative as them even though we have the same needs. Um, that's just one problem I have. I have uh, something to say, because there's a, a, a good idea that some states are doing, and it's pretty under, underrated. And it's a separate body of people elected to draw these congressional district lines. Um, I know a few smaller states are doing it, because it's a small state thing. We, we are a, a big state with a, a large population. And so these elected body, elected by these people of the state, would uh, draw these districts. And the advisory commission, um, which advises the state legislatures, which I think is sort of what this is, uh, is an advisory commission. So I, I do think that the bipartisanship uh, should be promoted more. And the partisanship, the polarization in Pennsylvania is uh, with the districts being split like they are and cracked and packed as they are, is a little disheartening, especially for uh, somebody who's going to be voting in the next election like myself, so. Well, thank you, and I, I think we're all particularly impressed with the fact that I would, from your, your remarks, I would have guessed you had another 10 years on you at least, so. Thank you, thanks to you and your parents <laughs> and your school. Um, an interesting idea, it's not one I've come across before, I don't know if anyone else has, or. Are there comments or questions about that in particular? Yeah, go ahead, Amanda. So one concern that's been raised when that idea has been brought up is how do the people then get elected? So then are they owing to the people who elected them and the money that comes into play and will there be corruption that enters in that way? So how would you see electing people to draw district lines, you know, statewide, if you will, being different from you know, just somebody else is elected as a part of their already elected job to draw a district line. As I was sitting in the audience, I was actually thinking about this, the same exact thing that you brought up because I um, was thinking about saying this about the elected body and thinking about this problem that you brought up. I don't know, and what he said about the, the who and the what and the how. The thing is, is that it would be a, a tricky situation and I'm no expert so I wouldn't know who exactly would elect these people. I would think that it would be um, sort of as it, it's done with the districting but that's exactly what the problem is. So it's just a big uh, 
mess, I would say. So. It is. I mean, there's no maybe perfect solution. So with every great idea, and it's good to hear all these different ideas, but there's always trying to look at all the different sides and think through how they all work. So um, thank you for bringing it up, though. It is. No one else has brought it up yet. <laughs> and I just have a, a question. This is an advisory commission, correct? So you guys will be advising the state legislature on how the lines are being drawn? The legislature and the governor, yep. Yeah, okay. Um, this is temporary. This is a 15-person commission, correct? All right, That's just that was my uh, question. And this is going to be, I'm guessing, not existent after the end of the summer, you said? Yes, that's, that's the plan. Yeah. And, and I should point out, if you hadn't guessed, we're all volunteers. Yeah. Uh, this is a, we're making time to do this. Mm -hmm. I guess technically the only person who was on the clock is Senator Costa, but, <laughs> but he's here from a, made a couple hour drive too. So, uh, but, but yeah, the, the, the plan is once our report is uh, submitted, uh, then this sunset, this uh, commission sunsets as it were. Okay. So I do think that this is a good idea, but I think it would be uh, a, a good idea to have a governor appointed commission to be continuous um, advising the state legislatures as some states already have. So a continuous advisory commission to, um, I think this was brought up by the past speakers, to advise the state legislatures to have more of a bipartisan lines drawn. Great, thank you. Uh, quick note, because we've heard a couple of chirps. Uh, if you could take a minute to just make sure your cell phone's off. <laughs> So, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going to guess you're Robin? I'm Robin. Robin Coxon. Oh, I think Amanda has. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have another question? Well, since you talked about the advisory commission, there are some states that do have advisory commissions that are advising the legislature on how to draw maps. So, would you think that advise, an advisory commission then would be appropriate as well? I mean, they serve sort of a different role than what we are here because we're more advising the state legislature on the rules they should establish to govern the who, what, and how. Whereas the advisory commissions that exist in other states are there that are actually like advising them, you should draw the lines this specific way in the context of the rules that exist. So do you think that that kind of an advisory commission would be something that should be considered? Yes, I do. Okay. Um, also, I know this is a little off topic. I just like to put the my two cents in before I stop talking, <laughs> is that um, I know that you guys are talking to the state legislatures and I know Senator Jay Acosta, I mean, Acosta is here. Um, I just would like to say that I think Pennsylvania should have open primaries. As somebody who will be voting in the next election, and seeing the polarization of the parties between the Democrats and Republicans, and personally, I align more with the independent view because I would like to be able to vote for the next president and the next um, Congress people that are being in the next election, but unfortunately in the primaries I would not be able to because if I register as an independent as I plan to when I turn 17, um, I would not be allowed to vote for You're, a Republican. Or right. You, you were, uh, we heard that same sentiment at Williamsport. You may know there is, a, uh, there is a bill in the Senate now that would allow independents to vote. Uh, and uh, I know there's a great deal of interest in the House. Uh, so that may be something whose time will start to come. So thank you. Uh, Robin, your, your two or three minutes. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you, commissioners, for being here. And thank you, Governor Wolf, for having this advisory commission formed. I think it's important. Uh, my name is Robin Coxon. I'm from Conyut Lake, Pennsylvania. Um, I'm a personal care assistant and a small business owner. My husband and I have a produce uh, business. We operate seasonally. Um, I'm also a member of Fair Districts PA and recently uh, was uh, appointed to the steering committee. So I'm new with that. It's interesting. Uh, went to Harrisburg last year for the big rally in the rotunda. That was exciting. Um, so activism is kind of new to me within the last couple of years. Uh, my representative is Park Wentling, who I do meet with periodically, and I need to do that again, um, send postcards and that type of thing, and uh, I have submitted letters to my newspaper, the Meebo Tribune. Um, let's see. 
Oh, I'm sorry, my state senator, Michelle Brooks, uh, who uh, I did meet with her as well with a group of uh, other members of Fair District. Um, so yeah, I worked at the polls last year um, just to have people sign petitions and inform them about gerrymandering. A lot of people weren't aware of uh, the effects of gerrymandering and that it even existed. Uh, we had a lot of good comments. Uh, the one guy said, well, why should I signed it my party's in you know leadership right now and so we explained well uh if it's not decided within the um the legislators that the court gets to decide it and uh that's democratically controlled so he actually did sign our petition after that so <laughs> so um, some just some information education for people uh i think uh one of the things that i don't i truly don't like uh about how the the lines are drawn now is that it's done in secrecy, I think that the transparency part of uh, what was uh, in the bill was uh, very important before. Um, that I think it had maybe three public, publics, I don't know what they call it, but brought out to the public to see before any maps were to be decided upon. I think transparency in that respect is important for the, the voters of Pennsylvania. Um, as uh, you had asked who I think or what of the three criteria that you listed were important, I think the who, who's drawing these uh, lines, that's the most important thing to me. I think that politicians, it's too tempting for them, both uh, Republican and Democrats, uh, kind of, uh, I don't want to use the word collude, but, <laughs> but they go together and they kind of say, well, you know, if I can have this, you can have that, and I think that's wrong. I think that's... Uh, undermining our democracy, and I think we can do a lot better in Pennsylvania. So, um, uh, let's see. And again, uh, of course, when you draw districts, you're gonna have certain ones that will be weighing heavily Republican and Democratic, even if it's done without people knowing how, how people are voting in certain districts, and, and that's okay with me. I mean, I know, uh, Representative Wentling was uncontested the last time because there just was not anybody willing because they knew that it was so tilted toward him that I think that they figured why run. Um, but if it's drawn fairly and we do have a Republican representative, I'm, I'm, all, I'm okay for that um, because that's the will of the voters. And even though I have met with uh, Representative Wentling and I've talked about him about open primaries and gerrymandering and a few other things. Um, he listens, he's very respectful, but again, he doesn't really have to move on anything because there's no challenge to his seat. So, and a number of seats in Pennsylvania are that way. And I just want a little bit more competition. I think that again, the, as Don has said, um, we need certain things done in our communities and they're really not being done because I mean, they, they don't have to be done. So, and again, I think transparency and taking it out of the, the, the hands of the politicians is super important. So. Great, thank you. Questions, comments? I guess, and I think, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so I think in government, we work best when our margins in terms of our majorities are close mm -hmm. and tight and right. we work well together, right. um, but a couple things. What do we do if we go down a path where we do lines through an independent commission mm -hmm. and it's determined that we are creating a perpetual majority, um, a sizable perpetual majority for one party over another? Do we recommend, do we go back to maybe is that something that an advisory committee oversees and recommends maybe we come back in? Because there's some concern and some folks believe that if we do it simply based on numbers it's without numbers. incorporating mm -hmm. any other information that there's a strong likelihood that we could end up with one party controlling um, both chambers in the Senate and the House um, in perpetuity, mm -hmm. or at least for 10 years, I should say. Right. But um, just so, to, again, going back to figuring out how we, great right. earlier point was about compromising. What do we incorporate into that discussion to arrive at something where we create competition? Um, because the only way you can create competition, I think, is by having knowledge about maybe voting. I don't know, I'm just throwing this out, but registration, for example. How, mm -hmm. what, what criteria do we plug into the process to get to a point where we uh, have competition, that we don't have seven-eighths of the number of incumbents not having any opposition? 
just throwing it out to folks. I'm not sure right. what the answer is. I'm just, that's one of the yeah. concerns that we hear from folks. Yeah, I, mean, I understand that concern. And again, if it's done without bias, I think that at least it reflects fairly the citizenry and how they vote. And again, right now how it is, we have Republican rule and perpetuity, you know, or per just me, you know, I, I know that. Yeah, I, of, I know. I mean, so it's, it's actually, I mean, it's actually <laughs> happening now. But if it's drawn fairly, and again, if I'm represented, or represented by um, Representative Wentling, and and that's fair, and and again, maybe it won't be as stark. A, you know, uncomp, you know, the the competition may not be as like blatantly obvious that there is no competition. You can't do it perfectly. I understand yeah. that. Um, but as long as it's done fairly, and again, they would be redrawn every 10 years anyhow, and then again, maybe things could, would switch, so depending upon voters and how the turnout and stuff. But, but I mean, now the way it is, people are discouraged. They don't even think their vote counts, which in a lot of areas, in a lot of districts, that's true. So they don't even turn out. Maybe if they think that it's fairer, there'll be a better turnout, and maybe we'll get better results and better funding for our communities. So. We'll keep, I mean, all for those of you who haven't spoken yet, we'll keep all of these questions in the air yeah. so we don't put, because yeah. I think we're interested in hearing all of your thoughts on, on some of these very tough uh, questions. Um, let's move along to, I'm going to guess. Mike. Oh, Mike. Mike Wilcox. All right, here's a microphone. Thank you for, uh, for being with us. My name is Mike Wilcox. <laughs> Uh, I'm also from Cochranton, but Cochranton is such a huge municipality that it extends into three counties. I'm in the Venango County Corp portion of, of Cochranton. Uh, I'm a retired agribusinessman there. Uh, my representative is Arlie James, and my senator is uh, Scott Hutchison. District 64 for Hutchison, I've forgotten what Arlie's in. Okay, uh, many people here don't realize that we've evolved into a tribal system where political power is more important than right and wrong. This comes as a surprise to everybody, I'm sure. Uh, the results of eliminating gerrymandering uh, last year by the Supreme Court the majority of the vote cast went from 13-5 Republican to Democrat to 9-9, nine nine, even though Democrats still had the majority votes cast, it was uh, equalized a lot more. When you are in the minority in a heavily gerrymandered district, you don't have a representative. You don't have, there, there's just no way. They're not gonna respond. Uh, one other qualification or uh, something against me is that I'm one of the co-founders of an indivisible group in Venango County called Oil Region Rising. Uh, we're very active politically, so active that the letter, the letter in the letters to the editor column, our local newspaper editor uh, insists on identifying me as one of the steering committee members of Oil Region Rising for every letter that we publish. You know that we publish. Uh, I don't know why, whether that's good or bad. Okay, an example of lack of representation. Arlie James attends on a fairly regular basis meetings of the Venango County Tea Party Patriots. He's been invited, but he doesn't even respond to an invitation to attend our meetings, which generally run from 25 to 40, 40 people. Uh, I invited Scott Hutchison to view my solar system because there's legislation pending about uh, improving the uh, possibility of solar. That was three weeks ago and uh, I talked to his secretary and he hasn't had time to call me back. Uh, to keep this short, one possibility that I haven't heard yet, because the gerrymandering has worked out in U.S. congressional uh, redistricting. One possibility, again, realizing that it might involve an amendment, 
to the Constitution would be to assign all senators, all Pennsylvania Senate seats, and all representative Senate seats to stay within each political, U.S. political district. We know that they're set up fairly right now as a result of what happened in 2010. I don't know if this is a good idea or bad, but at least you would eliminate or reduce the possibility of one party controlling the redistricting of Pennsylvania seats. Uh, I guess that's really all I have to say. Thank you. Comments, questions? would demonstrate to you, because it seems like you're putting a lot of faith that the congressional districts we have now were drawn fairly, because you're suggesting perhaps that they be used as the confines for the other districts. So what about the districts as they're drawn now demonstrates to you that they were fairly drawn? Uh, in 2018, we went from 13 to and 5 Republican to Democrat, that to nine and nine. And of that nine and nine, there were at least three districts were still competitive. Okay? Another thing that we noticed about the, uh, all right, I'm in District 15, which, you know, a Republican hound dog would win no matter what. Okay? <laughs> a Democrat will, will not be elected in District 15. I understand that, okay? But I noticed that in District 16, whereas our, 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 excuse me, our representative, U.S. representative in District 15 is proud of the fact that he wants to cut Social Security to balance the budget. Now, I see a lot of television, I see a lot of television ads for the race in District 16 and I noticed that our representative that was in a competitive, or excuse me, your representative, which is in a competitive district, made a point to advertise that he wasn't going to cut Social Security or Medicare. Our representative in District 15 didn't care because he was safe no matter what. That's the advantage. If you don't, if you're in a heavily gerrymandered district, you really don't have representation. So it's important. Uh, yeah, there would be problems with this. It would take us uh, uh, an amendment, uh, a constitutional amendment, probably to require this. But it's something that I think might reduce the advantage that one political party might have in many districts. Great. Other questions for Mike? Okay. Why don't we move along? I'm going to guess. Are you Logan? Uh, Logan Ford, here's a microphone for you. Luke, you kind of stole my thunder. I thought I'd be the youngest one here, but I'm not. <laughs> but thank you for being here. I'm pleasantly surprised by that. Uh, my name is Logan Ford. I am a third year student at Mercyhurst University, but I was born and raised in Erie County my entire life. Um, I'm studying political science, so that all of this stuff is regular terminology for me on a day to day basis. Um, I'm going to give you some free marketing right now, David. I participated in Draw the Lines uh, during their last competition. I believe my map is actually on display back there, me and my teammate. So we have firsthand experience with trying to balance these district lines. Um, and the way we ended up, well, all right, first, uh, I represented by uh, Representative Bob Mursky and State Senator Dan Laughlin. And I am actually currently completing an internship in Senator Laughlin's office. So for all of you, his constituents, I can promise that um, he's getting an earful of this every single day. <laughs> um, so one of the biggest things that I find wrong with, not necessarily wrong, but one of my most discouraging points with politics, even though it's a passion of mine, is the current political climate. I'm sure that everyone in the room is at least a little bit aware that it's hostile and nasty and just despicable right now. The days where a Republican and a Democrat congressman could go after session, get lunch, and go back to fighting about policy is fairly long go gone. 
And I feel that the political process truly starts at the local level. And therefore, because of gerrymandered districts, it feeds into this nastiness and polarization that is tearing the country apart right now. Um, the other thing that with gerrymandering that is a big issue for me, and it's been brought up before, is how communities can be divided into different districts. Um, speaking as an Erie citizen, I remember uh, the last map that we had where we had Glenn Thompson in the uh, west and Mike Kelly, or all well, the way around Mike Kelly in the west and Glenn Thompson in the east. And I understand that one argument might be that now Erie County has two voices in Congress, but that really wasn't the case. Um, that's part of the reason uh, Sophie, my teammate who couldn't be here today, and I drew our map the way we did. We surrounded and started with communities of interest is what we called them, meaning you shouldn't have to divide Pittsburgh up into 17 districts just so a Republican has a fair shot. The same way you shouldn't have to divide the center of Pennsylvania up into 18 districts to make sure that a Democrat has a fair chance. If you're from Pittsburgh, you should be represented by the same person as anywhere else in Pittsburgh. Same thing for Erie, same thing for Philly. And if that compromises competitiveness on that level, that's fine. But we were able to work it out to a point where it was still equal across the state. There were certain independent districts that were very competitive, but there were also some that leaned to the left, some that leaned to the right, and those balanced out themselves. And that really uh, brings me to how I think we can improve this process. Um, there's been several sentiments today, and I don't want to be redundant, but I truly think it's the best way that we have to start with the community. Uh, Draw the Lines is a program that really sets us in the right direction, I think. Um, I'm by no means the most qualified person yet. I plan to get those qualifications, but I don't even have a bachelor's degree yet. And uh, we were able to develop a map that had more competitive districts than the one that the Supreme Court laid out for the last midterm elections, and we were able to uh, make one that had more compact districts. It's not difficult to try to improve upon a system if you just take the time. So I really think that the citizens should get engaged. Um, in conjunction with the legislature, I know that there was talk of how Ohio does it, how they need a supermajority to approve something that the, their commission already um, submits for approval. I think that's a great idea, but to truly depoliticize the process, I think we need to get this whole starting point back into the hands of the citizens because it's by the people for the people, not the other way around. Thank you, Logan. I'm going to ask you a question since you've been through this draw the lines process. Um, and it gets to probably the how part of the three part play that Amanda articulated. Um, you know, a lot of the language around uh, public input has been, I'll say, fairly traditional. We should have public hearings. Amanda's been a participant in those public hearings. Sometimes those neither involve the public nor much hearing. Um, so I guess one of the things we're thinking about, given that you know, we've had such incredible advances in technology, that tools like Draw the Lines are available uh, to folks like you, and you've demonstrated that you can master them pretty well. Can, do you have thoughts on how, let's just say, the public participation process uh, could be improved that might draw on folks like you who've actually demonstrated, you know, you spent a few hours and drew a map, or, or other ideas about how we can move the public participation part into this, into uh, drag it out of the 20th century and into the 21st century. So um, I was introduced to the program through class. Um, obviously, that won't work for everyone. But I think that it, people will naturally be brought to it if it's publicized enough because of how underrepresented certain people feel in certain districts today. Uh, another classmate of mine also participated in the first competition, and her map, I'm gonna use the word crazy in an endearing way, but it, would ha it went from Erie County all the way down to the southern border and then all the way over to central Pennsylvania. And it wasn't contiguous, but it was fair and balanced. And she found a way to balance Philadelphia, she found a way to balance Pittsburgh, and all of the center of the state sort of by making this rainbow go into the state from Philadelphia. 
So, and, oh, and she is from a district traditionally, she's not from Erie, but she's from a district traditionally where she, as a Democrat, does not feel that her voice is ever heard in any election. And that, I really think, is what inspired her to invest more time than I probably invested and more time than others to really get dirty, get personal, and just tediously adjust this. So I think maybe, and I, I don't want to say this because it sounds awful, but the more desperate people are, the more they will be drawn to find solutions for themselves instead of just sort of moping around and waiting for someone to hand them the answer. Thanks. Other uh, questions for Logan? I'm just curious, did you, you did congressional lines. Did you do state senate and state house lines as well? No, we did not. Okay. We, we haven't stood up that competition. The plan is uh, that that would be this fall. We'll do the state senate districts and the state house districts. Well, the reason I ask is in terms of the challenges that you saw, we talked about in our constitution, it talks about compactness and contiguousness and, you know, unless absolutely necessary, you don't split municipal boundaries. Did you find that to be, what, what of those criteria, what did you find most challenging to, in order to accomplish on the congressional lines as, when you did that? Because those same criteria are part of the congressional part as well. Uh, I can say the easiest would be to make the districts contiguous because that doesn't necessarily take into account the percent Democrat, the percent Republican. Um, but the hardest, I think, was making sure that the municipal boundaries aren't broken unless absolutely necessary. We didn't really find at any case that we could make a district competitive without breaking those boundaries. Okay, and then in your, the work that you did, then you did take into consideration um, registration or performance um, to make them competitive? Yeah, so the way we started is first with those communities of interest, like I mentioned. We didn't want to divide Pittsburgh, per se. Sure. Um, but after that, then we went back and sort of fine-tuned to make them as competitive as possible. Um, to varying success. The district that ended up being, including Erie, was 34% R, 34% D. Uh, but we also, you know, there's four districts in Philadelphia that were heavily to the left, and there was, we ended up actually making a district that completely surrounded Pittsburgh in the downtown areas, and then a, that ring sort of was a district just for the suburbs. So um, it, it's not, all possible, but at the end, we can still make it competitive on the state level. Other questions for Logan? Terrific. Let's move on to our last uh, participant, and I don't have a name for you, so I'm Jim I assume Thompson. you. Thompson. Can everyone hear okay? I'm partly deaf. Uh, anyway, I, in the uh, I, I, for 25 years, I was a political writer for the Erie Times, which was by far the largest paper in northwestern Pennsylvania. And uh, I was on the editorial board. I've covered District Dean since 1970. I worked for the Meadville Tribune before coming up here, and I've lived in Butler County. So I have a pretty good view of this district. Butler has nothing in common with Erie, by the way. Uh, anyway, the founding fathers, in my opinion, did not want politics at play in this at all. And when they formed the counties, they used rectangles. And when they formed the con original con congressional districts and, and state senate and house districts, they use rectangles, we should use rectangles again. The solution, in my mind, is simply colleges and computers. I've given Kathy Dahlkemper letters I've written to the editor in the area here, and then I hope she will share, she probably has already shared them with the committee. Uh, but the upshot, edit, I think that uh, we should use computers and college students, not poli-sci students, but computer students, and uh, have them prepare maps, and then the maps, uh, and, would go to a commission, and the commission would pick three that would go to the legislature, and they choose from the three maps for each of those categories of districts. Uh, I think it's that simple. What I've heard today, today is a lot of things that, that keep putting politics back into this process. That, to me, is unpatriotic. It's not the way it was meant to be. They wanted the districts to look like the counties as much as possible. I know it's tough. You get down to Pittsburgh or Philadelphia. I know that's going to be tough. That's why you have three maps or whatever number they is decided on for a final choice. And anyway, I, I, uh, I think it works, and I think it should be like a, a mandatory vote. You I mean this? Do it and pick one of the three, and uh, that would take uh, politics out of it almost completely. 
that's my idea. Terrific. Got that as novel idea number two. <laughs> so thank you. Questions? Good. It's what the founding fathers. Well, here's here's a here's a question that has perplexed me. The point's been made that um, the U.S. Constitution clearly gives uh, the uh, the the power to draw maps, congressional maps, to the state legislatures. Our founding fathers were pretty good students of politics, and they understand they had to understand when they did that that state legislators are just as political as they were. So there had to be some implicit sense that like, it's okay that we hand this important process over to elected officials, people who traffic in politics. So how do you square that with, with your reading well, of the I situation? Well, I agree with you. I, I think you square it this way. The, the part of the state's rights issue is that each state then would determine how to do this it, if in the, within the legislative process and it would be fairness would be number one. And uh, I've just put, uh, put out what I think be a fair way for Pennsylvania mm -hmm. to proceed with this. And and it, it's really just going back to the original. And similarly, our constitution, at least from 68, puts in leaders as the members of the reapportionment commission. That's what the constitution says. So it, it embeds into the process political leadership. So again, the question about how do we reconcile these things, I think that's... Yeah. Well, well they could go through that process. Just as a, a, a bit of history, I did some looking into the Constitutional Convention of 1967-68, where, as Senator Costa points out, from which emerged the Legislative Reapportionment Commission. Yay, Ray Schaefer. <laughs> <laughs> there is in there, in the materials prepared for the delegates, there's a statement that says, essentially, this whole gerrymandering thing will be taken care of in a few years because we've developed sophisticated models that we can use that will make this whole issue moot. <laughs> Would that it were. <laughs> we didn't uh, have computers, but back So back I'm a little, <laughs> I'll have personally, I'm a little skeptical of, uh, it didn't turn out to be true 50 years ago, I'm a little skeptical of handing things like this over to, uh, uh, to algorithms, because we also know algorithms have wrought a, a lot of havoc in other parts of our lives as well. But I don't want to, you also said, well, let's, let's put Logan in a computer on the case, and maybe that's a, maybe that's a different story. But. I'm sure he would do better than our legislature. <laughs> okay. Amanda. So you kind of talked about this being a three- part process. So you have sort of a group of people that are drawing the maps to just sort of comply with the rules as they see them, which would be these college students and the computers. And then you have a commission that's sort of taking those maps and deciding which three are the best. And then you send it to the legislature, if I understand this correctly, and then they vote on one of those three to say that's the one that we should use. So I heard you say about the college students being sort of involved in the map drawing process, and obviously the legislators are the ones approving it, but who's, who do you see as being on this commission that would be picking the three maps? Several good ideas have come up today, and, and I, I don't have the answer for that. But back to the students and that, they'd be working, since I said give it to the computer students, not the poli-sci students, they would have the census numbers, and they would have the computer. That's easy. Um, we have uh, time for one more question. I'll look at my colleagues here and see if anybody's got one. Uh, all right. Okay, go ahead. Uh, transparency came up earlier, and I was just wondering, one thing that was mentioned in talking about transparency is that if we had public hearings ahead of time before the maps were drawn, that would help with transparency. And I will tell you that did happen the last time because the commission that Jay Costa served on had public hearings prior to them drawing the maps, which I testified at. And yet, that problem, that the, what I'm hearing is that maybe that there was still room for more transparency in that process. So I'm wondering if there's something in addition to that, if that really is sufficient just to have those public hearings in advance of drawing the maps, that will give the transparency, or if there's something else this group might suggest that would also improve transparency other than just having a public hearing at which people can speak up and the topics discussed before maps are voted on. 
I think some of the thing, there's conversations about having all of our discussions, like our reapportionment commission, when we did that, that instead of having any conversations and executive session to some degree, that all conversations take place in public and those negotiations. I mean, that's one of the things that's been talked about. I don't know whether or not that's where we end up at, but if you're asking the question, what, next, what would the next step be? Because um, we did have open meetings and we did have all these maps during that whole process in 2011 and 2012 on the websites and people's suggestions were there, et cetera. And, um, but that would be the next level of openness and transparency, I think, would be having everything done in public view. We just do a quick poll of the server of the focus group with, with, with that level of transparency that Senator Costa be uh, meaningful and acceptable and an improvement for you folks. Yes, no, maybe. Yeah, I also think that one big problem is um, for sure citizen participation. I mean, we have a, a privilege in this nation to be able to it's not only a privilege, it's our right to be able to um, watch all these public hearings and attend these and vote especially. And so, I mean, even Chicago, this last um, election for their, their mayor, I believe the number was less than 46% of Chicago voted. So there's a, I, I believe the transparency is there. The transparency is there in the, the um, public hearings that you said you had before the last session that uh, approved the maps happened. So um, there could definitely be steps to improve the transparency, but it's there. It's just in the, the citizens' hands now to act. Yeah, and I think also the difference between 2011 and today is just awareness. I think a lot more people are aware of the unfairness in our democracy. So I think that if you did similar things to advertising it and such before, do those and then maybe add some other elements because I think that more people want this fixed and I think there's just more awareness and education about it now. So, so let me push, just push you on that for a second. Mm -hmm. Even if we had the same process in place, which is the General Assembly does the congressional maps and the Legislative Reapportionment Commission does the legislative maps. Do you think that the awareness, engagement, and knowledge about this issue is sufficient to uh, ensure more fair maps? No, because I still think the politicians need to be removed more than what they are from that. But I think the transparency part of, of having the the hearings and stuff might have been sufficient at the time, but I just don't think enough people were aware of what was at stake. And I think more people would be involved now if they had the opportunity and knew that it was happening. Great. Thank you. Uh, I, I just have to note the, the poetic justice that just as the word transparency was uttered, <laughs> that the sun Beautiful. came through Beautiful. the window. I was like, you can't see. Sun. The <laughs> Sunlight is, as has been said, the best disinfectant. So thank you all for joining us. Uh, and give them a round of applause for being with us. We uh, have one more panel signed up, although you're, you're certainly welcome to, uh, to keep signing up. Uh, so if I could ask uh, Mary Rennie, I think, and Frida. Freda, sorry, Tepfer, and Joe G, and Glenn McKnight, and Vicki, we'll see what Vicki's last name is, if you could come up to join us. Come on down, folks. Yep, yep. Have a seat. Pick a seat. So, oh, you don't want to. Okay, this is. Folks, if I could. Mary, ready? Make sure that this last panel gets up here, and if we could. Uh, 
fine. You're fine. You're fine. Quiet the hubbub a little bit. Perfect. Okay. I'm a last minute addition, so I'm not. Yeah, it's all right. Very nice to meet you. Thanks for doing this. This is so important. All right. They didn't go in order this time. So yeah, maybe we'll go right to left in the interest of partisan balance, right? <laughs> um, so, ma'am, if you could identify yourself, and I don't, uh, I'm not very good at guessing anymore. But if you could, uh, again, the drill is, tell us a little bit about yourself. Who represents you in Harrisburg? Uh, what's wrong with what we're doing? And what, what do you think we could do to make it right? Sure. Um, my name is Mary Rennie. I'm a lifelong resident. Can hear you. Sorry. Is this, can you hear me? No? Microphone's on? OK. All right. All right. I'll hold it up. How's that? All right. Okay, my name is Mary Rennie. Nice to see everybody here. I'm a lifelong resident of Erie in Erie County. I'm the former director of this library system, actually. Um, and I'm currently, full disclosure, a candidate for county council locally. Um, I am, my state representative is Bob Mursky. My state senator is Dan Laughlin. I really believe that everyone should be concerned about the, the districting and the redistricting, uh, when it comes right down to it, and this really ties back to the philosophy that I had with my staff here behind the programs and services collections we developed at the library, that a government of, by, and for the people is not simply feel-good language. It has broad consequences economically, uh, socially, culturally, when you have voter disengagement, disempowerment, and that's really what gerrymandering is. It's, a, it's one more piece of voter disempowerment. Um, there are many studies that show that community engagement, which is also civic engagement, is vital to economic development. So you can't really separate economic, political, civic and social engagement within communities. And when you discourage that process, you do it at your own peril. So um, I know that you may have talked about this already, that there is such a thing as an efficiency gap, and I'm sure you're aware of it, uh, by the Public Policy Institute, a statistical formula measuring um, participation and a partisan advantage and that Pennsylvania work ranks, I think it's like 39th or 40th uh, in the nation. And this has to do with the, with the redistricting of 2011, of course, but the fact that it is as egregious as it is, you know, and we've talked about, I think in some of the previous sessions, whether it should be left up to the legislature, um, I think it should be done through an independent commission, and I think there are a number of ways of appointing that commission. I think it could be done through a statistical model and maybe a combination of an independent commission. I think that might be a good idea. I do agree that common communities should be left intact. Um, Erie County was not left intact in the last redistricting, and uh, it's already a proven fact that um, that poor people are less likely to vote. So when you already have that disempowerment, that disenfranchisement going on, and you add gerrymandering on top of it, where is Erie County left? Uh, we have to change this model. And I, I don't want to see after the fact solutions, such as lawsuits, um, which again, you know, it's, closing the barn door after the horse is out. So uh, that's my opinion. Open to questions. Thank you. Well, let me throw out the first pitch and then I see Amanda's ready to, to jump in as well. So you, you mentioned something about um, 
you know, maybe coupling an independent commission with uh, sort of the use of technology algorithms and so forth. Do you have, can you give us some better sense of how you think that, that could work? And well, sort of sounds like a two-stage process of some sort. Well, one of the things that we've talked about, and I've heard the comment of not leaving it up to an algorithm, and I can see the, I can see the wisdom in not doing that. On the other hand, um, if they can measure, uh, if they can measure where states are lacking in, in terms of fairness, um, I don't know why that measure couldn't be taken into account right from the get-go. Now, there are different ways of drawing the lines according to the, the divide between Democrats, Republicans, and so forth. Um, so at that point, you know, once you have those statistical numbers, to me, then, once you've got that, then it would default to the independent commission, and I think those people should be appointed by, with it, from within the legislature, but again, a super majority. I think that makes sense. Amanda? Let's grab the mic. Um, I just wanted to clarify what you were saying about um, not wanting sort of after the fact uh, solutions, if you will, um, because so you would rather see a map drawn correctly, if you will, the first time rather than the, I guess it would be currently the court stepping in and having to fix the map yes. after it's already been drawn. Is that what you're meaning? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Once it's gone to the court, you have a broken system. We don't want a broken system. We want to get it right from the start. Just one question, and I was just thinking back to um, one of the previous groups, but um, particularly the two young people that were here, and the talk that there's maybe more um, understanding in the general public about the issue and how detrimental this is to, you know, really the future of our country in terms of being able to solve important issues. Um, you're on the campaign trail right now. Are you hearing people talking about this? I'm, I'm just curious. You know, beyond the room here and the people that I know are engaged, uh, from the general public, are you hearing that people know that this is an issue? I don't know that, I've had one person bring up gerrymandering to me, but um, I think a related issue is some of the um, political climate, I'll, I'll say that. Because when I walk around and you have both sides saying, and, and this has happened multiple times to me as I'm walking around. Well, I used to be a Republican, but then they got so crazy. And I've heard exactly, exactly the same statements coming from the other side. And I think when you have a political climate that's, that's that heated and that in your face, um, um, I can't think of a word I want to describe it, but unwilling to unwilling to compromise, unwilling to have discussion, um, that just makes this all the, this situation all the worse, I think. Um, but again, that attitude I heard re I've heard repeatedly over the last month of walking around. That's interesting. Another gentleman you know <clears throat> used the word we've heard before, which is a sort of political tribalism yes. and and uh, I suspect your experience is not um, unique. Uh, there, there is a lot of anger about that. Interestingly, as you said, coming from both sides. So, you know, I think one sort of job of this group and, and others is to try to figure out what it is that, that we could do structurally that would maybe heal some of those wounds and bring us back to a more productive, uh, kind of compromise driven like the way it was supposed to be, I think when we first created this whole thing a few few hundred years ago. Um, but you know, you're, the point has been made too, sometimes by folks who are comfortable with the status quo, which is to say, I'm not hearing people talk about gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. I'm not hearing people use that word redistricting, so what's the big problem? But that might be the, the insight that people are talking about this, this political anger that's out there. Yeah, so. and um, if Pennsylvania ranks as highly or as poorly as it does with regard to political partisanship and the district lines, and then if you look at some of the statistics that show where Pennsylvania is in terms of opportunity, 
and in terms of economic growth um, may or may not be a direct correlation, but the, the numbers are pretty similar. So just saying. Well, just one other semi-editorial comment. You know, there is an argument that says it, the less time we spend on this, if we can fix this, the more time we have to, you know, talk about, you know, schools and roads and water and energy and everything else that, that people do talk about all the time. So. Absolutely. Amanda, you had a comment. Um, so you mentioned the efficiency gap as being an appropriate standard. What leads you to believe that that would be an appropriate standard? Because that's measuring sort of the partisan makeup, if you will. And so are you thinking then that the district should be drawn to create a particular partisan outcome? And you think that's the, the fair outcome? Because we've heard a lot of different things today about that. So I was just curious why, out of all the standards you could pick, why did you pick that one as the one you think is most important? Well, the um, efficiency gap, and I don't know, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but that measures um, the number of voters who are either Democrat or Republican, the number of votes cast, not the number of registered voters, but the number of votes cast according to, and they, they measure it against the actual outcome of the, of the race. So to me, that makes sense. Now, you're gonna have people that cross the lines, obviously, and I think where you have people crossing the lines are more often maybe in the um, national races, presidential elections, I think, is, is likely uh, a race where you would see people crossing political boundaries to vote for one side or the other. But within congressional legislative districts, I think that's less likely to happen. Terrific, other questions, Senator? Okay. Let's, uh, let's move on, and uh, Glenn? Yes. All right, uh, Glenn McKnight, the uh, floor is yours, and thank you for participating. All right, thank you. Um, my state senator is Mr. Laughlin, and my uh, state representative is Mr. Mursky. Uh, I'm a science teacher in Mill Creek Township School Districts. We've lived in Pennsylvania for about uh, 24 years now, and um, the, I think what's wrong with the current process by leaving it up to the um, political leaders who benefit from being able to draw the lines to help ensure their own incumbency that, that it makes them feel more secure and appeal more to a more extreme base. And that if the districts were drawn in a way that was more geographically based, then they'd have to uh, um, be accountable to all their constituents rather than just the ones who had already agreed with them. Um, and the, uh, I'm, I was hoping that to actually hear some about more of the different ways in which democracies around the world have figured out how to do this um, since democracies have, this seems to me sort of fundamental to the basic process of democracy, the fair representation of the voters. and. How can it be that we're still figuring out how to do this at this point in the game when there's so many places have to have us working solutions to the same problem um, already figured out? So I would love to hear how do they do it in Switzerland or Germany or Norway or anywhere else where they've actually got a working democracy. What can we learn from them? Um, maybe we started it, but maybe they figured out something along the way that we didn't figure out. Um, Just a quick note on that, but uh, I suspect that Amanda know, may know this. I think in most other democracies, this is treated as a job for civil servants, for appointed officials, and, and doesn't enter the political fray. Do you, do you know more than that, Amanda? Okay. I think that's true. So it is, but it is, you know, it, it, it rests on this constitutional uh, framing that the U.S. Constitution says it's the job of the state legislatures to at least figure out how to do this. So uh, that I think is you know that's it. that's in the Constitution and that's our history and that's what we're trying to sort of work through. Okay, um, I would just love that if, to have the process be something where we could recognize the expertise of the people who were sitting down to work on an independent commission. As a science teacher, there's we recognize that different people have different expertise that I may not have. Um, there's surely there's experts who are familiar with the different models that have worked well in the past and could get the input from their 
state legislature of which fair model they think would work the best for us. Terrific. Questions for, for Glenn? All right. Thank you so much. Uh, Freda, is it? Good. Thank you for joining us. My name is Freda Tepfer, and um, I'm represented by Robert Mursky and Dan Laughlin. I've lived in Pennsylvania since 2011. I lived in Washington State for 30 years, where the district that I lived in, I lived in the same zip code for 20 years, and pretty much just two addresses. And that district evolved so much over time that it went from the Canadian border to south of Seattle, but just a thin line. And my theory about that was Democrats and the Republicans said, okay, Republicans, you can have all these most conservative voters and we'll, we'll give you that one. And that was my district. And it, it, um, it never changed. And, and that was a real disservice, I think, to us. Um, and that's part of what's wrong with gerrymandering. I, um, I was a volunteer a speaker for Fair Districts PA and went to one of their state meetings. And I was pretty sharp on all the stuff when I was being a speaker, but I'm a, a little rusty, so you'll forgive me. But I mean, what's wrong with the current process is that we can end up not unlike what I experienced in Washington with <clears throat> districts where we have, um, when I go to the Democratic Party meetings, we have people with just a little tiny piece of Erie County over on the east side or a little tiny piece on the west side. And it's like, it doesn't make sense. You, 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 it should be jurisdictions are together as much as possible. Um, how can we? And, and the idea, the efficiency gap, the idea that votes are wasted, that we're measuring what percentage of people's votes are wasted, it's, um, it's, a, it's a really sad thing. I forgot to mention that, like Mary, I'm also running for county council, and like Mary, in the very same district. So we have probably talked to some of the same people, even on the same day. And, um, what I hear is there's a lot of people who are independents, you know, they're usually the spouse of the person on my list, and I've been able to say, well, we're trying to fix that, that Erie County Democratic Party wants an, an open primary. But I've also talked to people who said, I don't vote, there's no point. And um, I was truly horrified to go to the primary in 2016 and have no choice for Congress, I, I just, I was stunned that, that nobody voted. But 3,000 people in the district roped somebody in, in that primary. Um, but they, nobody wanted to run because the district was unwinnable to a Democrat. Um, I liked what Fair districts and um, the the original bills that were put forward in 2017 and 2018. Again, I'm a little fuzzy on the exact details. Before, basically, the the House bill was hijacked. It was hijacked and and just turned into something totally un, unusable. And the same something similar happened to the Senate bill. I think there should be an a nonpartisan independent commission. And, and the, the commission may use data, but, but very little voter data should be used. Not, not the gross amount that was used in Wisconsin and other places. Um, the idea that a safe district could be doled out as a reward for correct voting at the legislative level or taken back from you, you know, that your, your district is redrawn so that you're no longer in it or that, that there's not enough voters to support you is, is just horrifying to me. Those are the things that can happen when there's such a partisan uh, districting. We did have two, two candidates for Congress in 2018. <clears throat> 
my candidate didn't win, but at least I had a chance to vote for somebody. Great, thank you. Questions, Amanda? I can't resist, because you said you lived in the state of Washington, correct, for 30 years? So are you familiar with how their redistricting process worked at all? I just kind of took a quick look, and it, it, it their commission doesn't sound so wonderful, actually. Well, they have an independent, what would be considered by some to be an independent commission, and it's sounding like you found that that form that they used in that state perhaps did result in the outcomes you thought it should have. So I was just curious about that because you mentioned those districts as being problematic. But um, particularly the district, like I said, I think that that was just kind of a bone that was thrown out. It's like you give us these things, and we'll give you the 39th. And, and be, you know, it was it was it was amazing. It was just this long, skinny thing, and it was right up against the national forest. So you know, and, and the Cascade Mountains. But it, it you know, it, it it was it was so long and very convoluted too. Thank you. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a last minute uh, addition. Okay, so, a pinch hitter, as it were. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. So. We're glad to have you. So just uh, uh, tell, tell us who you are, yeah, uh, follow the script, and we're happy to talk to you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> so again, I feel like the last guy who got on a plane, you know, and I'm holding up the plane, so I, I'll try not to be that guy. Um, but uh, Dan Mursky is my state representative. First of all, my name is Brian Graff. Um, I've uh, moved to Erie two years ago, so I'm new to the area, but I absolutely love it, and I really applaud what you're trying to do with this panel. And thanks so much for holding this meeting. Gerrymandering is a very important subject. Uh, Dan Mursky is my state representative, and Dan Laughlin is my state senator. Um, I'm a retired geographer uh, from the federal government for the Census Bureau and the Army Corps of Engineers. So my perspective might be a little bit different um, about what the, I guess what's wrong with the redistricting process. Uh, I think, um, well, for me personally, I'm going to say what's, what's wrong, really, again, it's what's been brought up multiple times, is just the, the marginalization of, of being a minority party voter and how you really don't feel like uh, you really have any input whatsoever into the process. I think that can be very demoralizing to, um, to an electorate if you don't really feel like you have any say in what's going on. And if gerrymandering keeps pushing that forward, um, I can see where people will be disenfranchised and might um, not vote. Um, but for me, uh, I think the big problem is, um, is lack of transparency um, about how the boundaries are derived, even from computer algorithms. Um, when, let's say, the, the parties do it, they would probably hire consultants who are experts in geographic information systems and using that types of data to generate these boundaries based on criteria that matter to them in terms of maximizing um, results in, in elections. And again, a lot of that is done behind closed doors, and it's, to us, it's a black box. We see the results of what's happening here. We get these maps out. We know that they're probably done for partisan advantage, but we have no idea what it is they're trying to, to maximize or achieve. Are they trying to uh, stock all or put all the Democrats or Republicans in one district so that they have their one district, but then the other party wins everything else? Are they trying to spread out the the voters, we don't really know that until after the fact when we can try to reason it out, reverse engineer what they've done. So again, there's, from our perspective, there's a lack of transparency uh, when the politicians are designing their own um, boundaries. And I would also say this principle of one man, one vote is, is laudable and absolutely necessary, and, but it's easily measurable. You can easily measure whether congressional districts are all the same number, but gerrymandering is much harder to measure and determine. Certainly if you've got an alligator or a parrot, um, yeah, that you can probably think that gerrymandering is occurring there, but you can have a contiguous and compact district that is gerrymandered. You absolutely can have that. And that's much more insidious and harder to find. So you know, how, again, so the difficulty of actually identifying and measuring gerrymandering is a problem. That gets that lack of transparency. We don't really understand what they're trying to do when they're making these boundaries. It's a black box to us. So what I would say uh, in terms of how we can improve it. I think an independent commission is the way to go, but even if there is an independent commission and we're using geographic information systems ourselves to, to, to generate these, 
these maps, that there has to be a transparency in our methods, processes, and data. We have, we have to advertise all that and, and also the criteria that we use to generate these maps so there's no doubt in anyone's mind that this is the criteria that was used. Um, and also maybe make that data available to the public so that they can run their own models. The parties, I'm sure, will do the same thing. And um, then you've got some type of transparency. But if you just present maps without any explanation as to how they were derived, especially using geographic information systems, I think that there might, again, people are going to see it as a black box, and they're going to question um, how you derive your results. And also, I would probably advocate um, multiple maps, um, because um, the odds of hitting it probably right on the first try are probably slim. Having multiple maps, especially if you use different criteria on these maps, again, you can explain what how the criteria were modified and, and, and use different data sets, like why did you modify the data? Or do some of them include parties, some don't? But that should all be explained. So um, I guess that's all I have. Uh, so there I go. Terrific. So I have one question for you. Um, thank, thank you, okay. Uh, last guy gets applause. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The last guy in the plane yeah. did okay. All right, all right. Okay, well, thank you. Since. Sounds like you, you have had a career in using data and GIS and so forth. Mm -hmm. In a process like this, if you're trying to achieve some fairness and some level of independence and integrity and so forth, are you, would we be better off specifies, specifying in essentially the le legislation what data can only be used or what data shouldn't be used? Okay, now you're talking you're, you're talking more to a guy who was just a, a government scientist who really doesn't dabble in that kind of thing. But I would say that um, I think you have to really be clear on what it is you're trying to um, accomplish with the, with the redistricting software. Like, what is it that, you, this is the key mm -hmm. thing, what are you really trying to optimize on? You know, what, is, what are the, the key components in data? And I think the gentleman, I'm not sure if he's still here, the Mercyhurst student, yeah, well, he would be, a, he's, that, that was really impressive. Like he outlined everything and why he used the data that he used. We need to do something like that. Somebody has to, ahead of time, determine, again, it can be done legislatively, so they, they could perhaps determine what it is, or the panel itself. This sort of gets at your issue of expertise. You know, what would experts use to try to be impartial um, and create um, boundaries that, that would try to be impartial? I think impartiality is very difficult. I mean, um, you probably have to have a lot of input from a lot of people to determine what would make them impartial. But I'm, probably, I'm definitely the wrong guy to ask that question, so probably everything I said here is gibberish. But um, I think it, we really, whatever, whoever decides that, it has to be explicit, and has to be spelled out and defined and captured very carefully. Good. Yeah. So thank you for moving to Erie. We're glad to have oh, yeah. you here. So, <laughs> um, I'm curious. The three maps, or, or multiple maps, then what, then after these maps are created, how do we use those maps to come out with a map that would be um, more fair? Well, it's interesting. I mean, in like in the field of cartography, they pretty well determine that, like, you can't convey all the information you want in just one map. You're better off generating uh, like a series of maps that try to illustrate the same problem in, in, in a lot of different ways. So. Different people will be uh, attracted to one map, other people will be attracted to a second one, and together you come up with the consensus of what you're trying to, to get at. In this thing, in this case, if you have three separate maps and you know, they could be derived from different criteria or different data sets, whatever, you have to explain that. And then there'll be some type of discussion period, I would think, where people would bounce these all off of each other and try to determine what was the best solution out of these three. And, may, and maybe you have to go back and Maybe you pick one that is like 90% there and needs to be tweaked, I don't know. But I'm certainly weak on the, the procedural part. I was speaking more from the, my background on geography and geographic information systems, so I'm a little weak on the. But that's actually what I, was, oh. what, what I was asking from your expertise. You know, how would you utilize these different maps to then find a way forward to a fairer map? Oh, I see. With, you know, from a fact base, not from. Right. The procedural way. Right. Well, if you explain to the, you know, again, if you have the people there who generated the maps, mm -hmm. based on the comments that were received back from the public, they could go ahead and rerun these maps based on either slightly altering the criteria or, or if there was some 
boundary that had to be maintained, like you, you must maintain this boundary, let's go ahead and do that and then rerun the algorithms and see what comes out. I mean, I, I suspect it probably would be an iterative process where you could go back and forth several times because that's the, the benefit of the software is that you, you can regenerate maps fairly quickly. You're not locked into a process that would take months to do. It would, would be a relatively quick process, I would think. So I'm, what, my interpretation of what you're saying is, let's say that a group of GIS folks were right. charged with developing three maps. One is the, is the most competitive districts. The one is the most compact districts. Mm -hmm. The one is the, that has the least amount of splits of jurisdictions. Right. So you have these sort of pure entrants, and right. then it would be the job of the a commission to sort of sort through and balance the priorities that were expressed in those maps to come up with what will essentially be a compromise. It could be because, you know, it's hard to optimize on everything in, in one algorithm. You know, you're going to have to optimize on one thing and then, and then have a satisfactory results in other things. So you're right. You could, you could try to optimize various runs and get different results and then say what really matters most. But if you already know what front matters most, you could go with one run. But right. At this point, we may not know, so. Yeah. Just, this is just, the last guy on the plane, so I'm, you know. <laughs> okay, Amanda, do you have a question? I have a question, but, well, just a comment, maybe that leads into a question. So it sounds to me like you're talking about the importance of establishing priorities, that it's very clear to everyone. In order for people to realize that the outcome is fair, everyone at the outset has to say, this is the priority, this is the outcome that we're looking for, and then different maps are generated to achieve that priority, and there's a discussion had around that. It sounds to me like that's sort of, if I just summarize what you're sort of describing here, the importance of prioritizing so that everyone agrees on that this is the priority we're trying to achieve here, and then. Yeah, certainly for like the first set of maps, you have to pick some criteria. Like, you know, you can't let the, these people just go wild on their own. They probably have to have some constraints in order to give you the maps that you would want. Um, and so you'd lay out some criteria that really matter to you in terms of making these districts fair. And I'm sure there's stuff in the literature that describes what the, that is, and that'd be a good starting point. And then later on, you could modify these maps. It's an interesting model that it sort of separates the generative maps from the evaluating and deciding and maybe coming to a compromise on the values that are expressed in the maps. It's sort of says this, this could be a two-step process or an iterative process, yeah. right? That's what I'm thinking. Yeah. In my naive way, I, yeah. so. Yeah. Well, I, I said, I mean, one of, the, <laughs> one of the things that we're trying to think through is, you know, some folks gravitate to expertise on this. We should just leave this to the experts. And I, I think the spirit of this exercise is to say, and other, but, but other, other folks say, well, we need common sense in this. So I think what we're trying to tease out is that there's a lot of there's a lot of wisdom, I mean, this is the this is democracy 101, right. that there's a lot of wisdom among folks who are uh, voters or who run for office or are knowledgeable. So uh, don't uh, don't no one I think has been has been uh, reticent today in, in sort of holding back their opinions, and that's what we're, we're trying to encourage. Uh, let me see if there's uh, any last comments or questions that we haven't got to or statements that you want to say something? Well, I, I almost wonder if what Pennsylvania needs is a constitutional amendment giving us the initiative and referendum process. The, the, all of the effort to try to get something through the 1718 legislature says, why, why is it so hard for the people to be heard that we have? But um, something and, tells me that might be fodder for another commission. Right. <laughs> but but and, and and then the I I am concerned that that this lead to something that the, all these discussions do lead to something. I would love to see it in time for the 2020 redistricting, but I don't want to see something for 2020 so rushed to be pushed through that it's not going to get us what we want. Let me pick up on that because I was going to ask that question because I think this gets to Senator Costa's question earlier. We are working in real time. You know, the clock is ticking in our ability to get a constitutional amendment in time for the next round. So would you take the deal that says maybe let's, 
let's do our best to fix the congressional process, which we can do by statute, but then acknowledge that there's not enough time to fix the legislative process, but let's put something in place that would take effect in 2030 rather than 2020. Would you take that deal or no? No. No? No. no. Sooner the better. Okay. Well, we might have nothing, so I'm not sure. Hmm. Mary? 2030 is way too far off now. We need something now. Okay. And, and you know, a referendum is one thing, but I think I would rather see us fix it in-house first rather than uh, going for a referendum, which then throws it back at us. And, well, how is that going to be done? You, mm -hmm. know, you may have a majority of people agreeing that you need to do something. Yep. But the hows and how of it is still to be determined. Right. But if you get to a point where we are out of time and something has to be done, do you accept a, um, a Washington state set up where you've got, it's called an independent commission. I looked it up sitting here, but it's a five member appointment, four appointed by legislative leaders and the fifth one picked by that person. Where on that spectrum do you compromise to get something done? Yeah. Um, otherwise you end up waiting to 2031. Through this whole process, though, um, again, that would be if you don't if you don't get it done by and we're running out of time, as we mentioned. Do you wait and still negotiate for ten more years to get to 2031 um, if you run out of time, uh, or do you take an approach where you do the legislative process on the congressional lines? I mean, I've had that legislation now for two sessions, where we would have an independent commission um, to draw the congressional line. Um, or do we, do we jump on that one and get that one done and see how that works for a period of time while we're continuing to explore what needs to be done on reapportionment for the state senate and state house seats? Um, at some point, we're going to have to make a decision, I think, along those lines. Not we, but I mean, I think fair districts certainly have been an integral part of this conversation, and they carry great weight with where um, members listen to great fair districts and common cause in, in the committee 70 and so many others. Uh, their input is valuable and their opinions are respected in that regard. So that, that's going to ultimately be a question we're going to have to confront. Okay. Uh, unless there's further comment or questions, uh, I'll thank you as well for joining us. Uh, thanks to all of you. Patrick, I don't. Is there anyone else signed up that wants to speak? Okay. Uh, a quick shout out of thanks again once to our wonderful uh, hosts here in Erie, and you have delivered again just remarkably nice spring weather uh, in this beautiful facility. Uh, thanks to my colleague Patrick Christmas at the Committee of 70 for his good work on this. Andrew Sharp from the Governor's Office, wherever Andrew is, uh, and the folks here in the Governor's uh, Regional Office for, for helping uh, set this up. Um, just as a reminder, uh, you uh, have a continued ability to uh, contribute your thoughts to this process. I mentioned the, uh, the uh, survey vehicle that we'll be sending out, uh, the website, pa.gov, where you have a chance to uh, share additional thoughts. I don't see a whole lot on the wall of democracy back there, but if you have a parting thought that you want to uh, share with us, you're welcome to do that. Um, and uh, we, as I said, this is number two of nine. Uh, so we'll be busy over the next uh, month. We are operating in real time. We're very aware of that. So uh, the, the spirit of things is speak now, forever hold your peace. This is the time for you and your friends and neighbors to, to weigh in on this issue. So uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, those of you celebrating Easter, have a, a wonderful, uh, happy Easter. Uh, and uh, we look forward to uh, your further thoughts. Thank you. Thank you.